Maria Teresa R. Lorenzo. Good afternoon. Welcome aboard to the fifth station of the Delex Pharma PQMRT. In this journey, we are offering you pediatric mechanical ventilation in focus to watch on. Let me introduce to you two experts in this field. Our first speaker is a pediatric intensivist. He took his fellowship training in pediatric critical care at the University of Santo Tomas Hospital. He is a fellow of the Philippine Pediatric Society and Society of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine Philippines, an associate professor in the University of the East, Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center, an accredited BLS and pulse instructor of the American Heart Association. He is currently holding the following positions. Section head PQ of UST Hospital and PQ St. Luke's Medical Center, BGC. Vice Chairman of the Department of Pediatrics Hospital in Ang Makati and Co-Chair PQ of Makati Medical Center. Currently, the President of the Society of Pediatric Critical Care who will discuss with us respiratory support made easy, the basics of mechanical ventilation, Dr. Alvin Florentino. Hello. First of all, I'd like to thank the program director of the PICU MRT and the Pediatric ICU Forum, Dr. Rodelia Cipriano, and of course, Delex Pharma for inviting me to speak on the basics of mechanical ventilation. We'll first go through a short introduction and then we'll proceed to the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system of children. We'll go through a certain positioning and uh, certain adjuncts that we use to open the airway, then we'll go to intubation and finally to the basics of mechanical ventilation. So almost all pediatric codes are uh, of respiratory origin. They begin with respiratory distress, proceeding to failure, and then apnea, bradycardia, and uh, finally, um, asystole. So as we all know, children are not small adults. The, the anatomy is different, very different between adults and children. So the nose is responsible for about 50% of the total airway resistance at all ages. And you know, because the nose is quite small for infants, uh, at least the narrowest, so blockage because of mucus or, or discharges may already cause respiratory distress since um, infants um, are usually uh, nose breathers. What more, the infant's tongue are large and uh, usually they lose tone when tone when they're sleeping of course when they're they're sedated or have uh, cns issues um, and uh, are frequent causes of uh, upper respiratory uh, obstruction now much lower you, we go to the larynx you, we notice that the glottis of infants are much higher and more anterior than adults so in infants their glottis at the level of the c1 for six months of age, it's about C3, and for adults, uh, it's already down to about C5 to C6. So for infants, a little hyperextension of the, of the neck may worsen the obstruction because of this high position of the glottis. So this is just an illustration showing the position of the glottis. Also for infants, the narrowest point um, of the airway is at the cricoid cartilage, uh, whereas for adults, it's at the glottic opening or the vocal cords. Children's epiglottis is also relatively large. They're omega-shaped and they're quite floppy uh, at, at, during infancy, but uh, develops more cartilage as, as the infant grows older. So much lower down at the peripheral airways, uh, the airway resistance is really high, especially for children. It's about 50% as compared to about 20% uh, only for adults. And because of this, um, because of the small and narrow airways of children, the resistance uh, to gas flow is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius, meaning the smaller the airway, 
the higher the resistance to gas flow and therefore it's very susceptible to obstruction from mucus plug edema etc even foreign bodies so um, the best way to open an infant's airway because of their large occ occiput is to put a towel under the head or under the shoulder and produce a sniffing position this is so that the um, the tracheal line the pharyngeal line and the oral line all line up uh, almost uh, line up together just to help open the airway so this is just a, a an image of incorrect positioning so this shows an infant with a towel under the shoulder and this is the correct um, sniffing position to open the infant's airway so here um, is another um, uh, maneuver that we use, especially for uh, basic life support. We use the head tilt and chin lift maneuver to open the airway. So this is one of the um, airway adjuncts that we use, a nasopharyngeal airway. Um, this is measured from the uh, tip of the nostril all the way to the tragus of the ear. And that way you know for sure that this is the correct size. Certain contraindications are basilar skull fracture, CSF leak, or uh, coagulopathy. We can also uh, use an ET tube as a nasopharyngeal airway. Just cut the ET and uh, insert that accordingly. Of course, you cut at the, uh, at the top portion and leave this, this end portion, of course, intact and clean. So this is another technique to open the airway. We have the oral airway and the measurement you, to make sure it, uh, it fits properly. You measure from the angle of the mouth to the, uh, the corner of the mouth to the angle of the jaw. So just you have to choose the correct size of uh, oral airway, like uh, such as here. This one is too long. The tip is already down to the epiglottis. And so this is too long. And this one is too short. It just abuts the rear portion of the tongue. So I got this photo from an old course that we used to teach. And uh, it just shows a child, of course, uh, at the emergency room. And just to ask the students, what do you see? What do you notice in this patient? No? So you see alar flaring and an anxious look of this child. And then of course you have air hunger, and use of accessory muscles, and then retraction. So all of these um, make you think that uh, this is already signs of severe respiratory distress. Okay. So here are other signs of respiratory distress, uh, tachypnea, tachycardia, grunting, uh, stridor, head bobbing, all of these. And then you have physical signs, retraction, use of accessory muscles, wheezing, prolonged expiration, uh, even, of course, apnea and cyanosis, and then lethargy. So this is just a review of uh, respiratory failure. We have the type 1 and the type 2. So, so type 1, it's the hypoxemic respiratory failure with your where your PO2 is less than 50 millimeters mercury. Your CO2 could be normal or, or low. And this is more likely due to the diseases that damage the lung tissue, such as pneumonia, ARDS, etc. Then you have your type 2 caused by uh, hypercarbia or an increase in CO2 of more than 50 millimeters mercury. You can also have concomitant uh, low PO2, and this is most likely because of diminished alveolar ventilation or you know, in, in issues where you cannot excrete your carbon dioxide, such as in chronic bronchitis, emphysema, you have uh, respiratory muscle weakness because of uh, GBS, depressed respiratory centers or level of consciousness. So some of the indications for intubation uh, of those patients with severe respiratory distress is a failure to oxygenate, failure to remove carbon dioxide with increased work of breathing for those uh, in severe asthmatic attacks, those in shock, those who have uh, neuromuscular weakness, such as in GBS, as was mentioned, you have decreased level of consciousness, a GCS of less than eight, 
or you have potential for deterioration, such as those with epiglottitis or uh, thermal inhalation injuries. So, of course, uh, you know, this is a very important um, uh, equipment that we use uh, to intubate patients. You have the straight laryngoscope blades, uh, they're the Miller blades, and then the Macintosh blades, which are the curved laryngoscope blades. Uh, these come in different sizes, of course, from uh, premature uh, size or weight all the way to adolescents and uh, adults. So the straight blades are usually used in the uh, younger kids with the floppy epiglottis. You, you usually use the tip of the blade to lift up your epiglottis to open up your airway here. So this is uh, why we use the straight blades. So for the curved blades, we usually use this for older children with, who have a more stiff epiglottis. We insert that up to the tip of the, or inside the vallecula. Uh, and when you lift up the vallecula, you also lift up your epiglottis and therefore open your airway. So these are just some of the equipments that we use um, for intubating infants. No? Anyway, the size of the infant is measured um, for, for uncuffed tubes. We use the formula age over four plus four. And for cuffed tubes, we use the formula age over four plus 3.5. And uh, the number that we get here, we just multiply by three, and that's how deep we will usually put the uh, endotracheal tube. So again, for those who've gone through PALS, um, I'm sure you know this uh, mnemonic. For patients who deteriorate uh, after intubation, and you have four things to remember. So the first is your displaced tube, obstructed tube, a pneumothorax, or equipment failure. So when patients uh, become cyanotic or you know deteriorate, lose consciousness, etc., after intubation, uh, any one of these four might be the possible reason. So now we move on to mechanical ventilation. So just a short history on uh, resuscitation. The, the first uh, written account, or one of the first written accounts of mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth resuscitations was found in the Bible, in Kings chapter 4, verse 32 to 35, where it says, Behold, the child was dead, and he went up and lay upon the child, put his mouth upon his mouth, and the fle flesh of the child waxed warm. Mechanical ventilation requires, of course, a thorough understanding of the physiology of ventilation. So whether normal or pathologic conditions, you know, you must know uh, the physiology of the body. And uh, of course, you have to be very familiar with the technical aspects of the machine. Sometimes some machines are, are different. So you have to know each, uh, each of the aspects, uh, technical aspects of that certain machine. And you have to appreciate the beneficial and detrimental physiologic consequences. So you know what to do uh, when you encounter these, uh, these adverse uh, events and consequences. So some of the indications or absolute indications for um, uh, mechanical ventilation is, of course, respiratory failure where you have failure of arterial oxygenation uh, with cyanosis, even at an FiO2 of more than uh, 60%. Your PaO2 is less than 70 millimeters mercury at an FiO2 of more than 60%. Your alveolar arterial oxygen difference is more than 300 with an FiO2 of 100%. Uh, or if you have inadequate alveolar ventilation and, and uh, your CO2 is starting to rise, your patient has impending hypoventilation, or the patient already has apnea. Some relative indications are to secure control of ventilatory pattern and function. So when you have intracranial hypertension, you'd uh, sometimes want to uh, uh, mechanically ventilate this patient, or at least hyperventilate this patient to decrease intracranial pressure. You also want to de decrease metabolic cost, cost of breathing in patients uh, in shock and with chronic respiratory failure. 
So there are certain goals you want to achieve. Uh, number one is to improve uh, ventilation and avoid significant hypercapnia and respiratory acidosis. So um, you don't want to go overboard uh, with regards to your, uh, uh, your carbon dioxide, but you also want to avoid hyperventilation and because if you blow off all your carbon dioxide, it may cause uh, cerebral vasoconstriction and therefore decrease your cerebral blood flow. And you also want to reduce the VQ mismatch or the uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch, um, but you also want to avoid hypoxemic tissue injury. Um, and so you want to decrease your FiO2 as soon as possible, uh, as long as, as as soon as the patient can tolerate it. But you also don't want to uh, provide, uh, maintain an FiO2 of 100% because the oxygen is very toxic to the lungs. Another goal was, would be to re-expand your atelectatic or collapsed uh, lung segments. So you, the, with this, you apply your uh, positive end expiratory pressure. You don't want it too high, except for certain in instances, uh, which we'll be discussing later, um, because you don't want it to over distend your alveoli, uh, because you might uh, be causing compression of your pulmonary vessels, and therefore you might reduce uh, venous return and therefore reduce cardiac output. And you also might cause volume trauma and uh, pneumothorax. The next uh, goal would be to reduce the work of breathing. So you want to uh, relax this patient, sedate this patient, eliminate the muscle fatigue. Um, you know, you might might need to produce, provide some sedation with midazolam maybe. And you also might want to control ventilation or uh, the patient's breathing with uh, by providing you know, neuromuscular blocking drugs. But then um, you, you don't want to give these for too long or too much because you might cause uh, respiratory muscle disuse atrophy, especially if you combine uh, neuromuscular blocking drugs with, with steroids, sometimes they're given. So that's, that's, um, that's, uh, uh, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be done or shouldn't be done for, for a long time. So just some of the nomenclature that we use. Um, so we, the first would be your peak inspiratory pressure, which is the maximum uh, airway pressure that we use, which is the sum of your inspiratory pressure and your positive end expiratory pressure. So that's your PIP. Of course, your PEP is the pressure that uh, opens up your airway. Um, so it's the pressure that's maintained at the end of a mechanical expiration, as opposed to the pressure maintained uh, at the end of a spontaneous expiration. So when patients are spontaneously uh, breathing um, <clears throat> on their own without the help of the machine, then you're providing an end uh, expiratory pressure. It's called a CPAP rather than your PEP, which is the pressure given uh, on a mechanical ventilation. Your inspiratory pressure, of course, uh, was explained earlier, which is the difference between your positive, uh, peak inspiratory pressure and your positive end expiratory pressure. Pressure support is just uh, a little support, at the, a little extra pressure um, while a patient is spontaneously breathing. So when a patient breathes on his own, you're giving little flow and that provides your little, um, uh, your pressure support. Inspiratory time, of course, is the time spent uh, during inspiration. And IE ratio is, uh, of course, the ratio between inspiration and expiration. And it's usually around one is to two or one is to three. But depending on the illness, let's say, for example, for asthma, you have a longer uh, expiratory time uh, rather than uh, just one is to two or one is to three. Your tidal volume is the volume of gas entering and leaving the patient's lung during a normal respiratory cycle. So just one normal inspiration and expiration, that's your tidal volume. FiO2, of course, is your fraction of inspired oxygen in the air. So room air is 21% oxygen. Uh, of course, with mechanical ventilation, you can give up to 100%, but be wary of giving more than 60% uh, FiO2 because this is already considered uh, toxic to the lung because it produces uh, reactive oxygen species and uh, it forms uh, free radicals, which may damage the lung tissue. 
Of course, respiratory rate um, is the rate that you uh, allow the patient or the machine to uh, uh, let the patient breathe. It's, it, this is, of course, in uh, the units are in minutes, no? so it's breath per minute. But um, some modes, as we'll be explaining later, patients can spontaneously breathe above the set rate. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this diagram. It just shows the total lung capacity and our tidal volume, etc. No? So, of course, uh, as was mentioned, your tidal volume is that one in the middle, which is about 8 to 10 ml per kilo. So this is just a normal breath, inspiration and expiration. That's your one cycle is your tidal volume. Functional residual capacity is um, if you expire uh, beyond your normal expiration, so it's it comprises expiratory reserve volume and your uh, residual volume. So that's your functional residual capacity. And we'll be talking about that a little later. Um, and your finally, your residual volume is after a maximum expiration. So that is your residual volume. And this is usually uh, what is left in your alveoli to keep alveoli open. So essentially, this is uh, almost like your uh, end expiratory uh, pressure and volume. So mechanical ventilators have certain modes where uh, which you use um, uh, when you apply uh, these ventilator strategies to certain patients. So the control modes, um, wh when you have a control mode, it's usually uh, all breaths are supported by the ventilator. So the patient is not, not able to breathe except at the rate that the, the machine is giving. But the newer control modes, like in assist control, uh, the patient may trigger a breath above the rate and it's also fully supported. As opposed to your SAMV or synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, patients can have spontaneous breaths in between that are not triggered uh, by the ventilator um, and then uh, can also be triggered uh, based on the number of or the rate that you also provide. So this is an example of your um, assist control. So you have uh, the ventilator giving all these breaths. Um, and when it notices a, uh, an, uh, an inspiration, so the, the machine will trigger, uh, the, I'm sorry, the patient will trigger the machine to give a breath. So then the machine gives the breath. And uh, as long as the patient does not breathe, but because of the set rate that the machine that you gave the machine, then it will breathe at the next uh, available rate that you gave at the available time that you gave. So for SIMV, like I mentioned, so you have your your particular rate. No? Uh, this is the rate that the machine has been uh, has is being is giving. Um, but like I mentioned, you can have spontaneous breaths in between. Uh, the machine triggered uh, uh, rate. And once the time uh, arrives that the machine should give a breath and the patient triggers that breath, then the machine will give the breath. So whenever a breath is supported by the ventilator, regardless of the mode, the limit of the support is determined by a preset pressure or volume, which we call pressure control or volume control. For volume control, you're the one who sets the tidal volume and the flow. And pressure becomes dependent on compliance and resistance. So the lower the compliance, the higher the pressure becomes. And uh, it's usually difficult to use or um, not advised to use volume control when you have large leaks around the tube or in uncuffed ETs because uh, you will not be able to deliver the volume that you want when there's a leak around the tube. The, the, the leak um, uh, releases all that uh, volume that you want to give, so it doesn't really deliver actual volume uh, to the periphery. It's also a little bit less um, comfortable because of the square flow waveform um, that is provided. For pressure control, you're the one who sets the uh, 
peak inspiratory pressure and the eye time. And in this control, the tidal volume is the one that becomes dependent on lung compliance. So that if you have low lung compliance, you also have low tidal volume. Uh, this is generally more comfortable uh, because it uses a decelerating flow pattern and is usually preferred for the non-compliant lungs. So this slide might be a little too busy, um, but it just uh, uh, illustrates that um, oxygenation is really uh, dependent on certain aspects like um, uh, the pressure of inspired oxygen, alveolar oxygen, you, even your carbon dioxide already present in your lung, the FiO2 you're giving, barometric pressure, etc. But first of all, let me just show that FiO2 is not necessarily equal to your uh, P, P small a O2 or your or your oxygen in your blood. Uh, the ratio is usually about one is to five. So an FiO2, let's say, of room air of 21 percent. Your, F, your PaO2 in your blood is about 105 millimeters mercury. So the ratio is about 1 is to 5, roughly. So if you're giving, for example, an FiO2 of 100%, then you expect a PaO2 of what, 500. Uh, 500, but usually we don't we don't achieve that even for normal lungs. But it's just to illustrate uh, it's usually usually uh, the case about one is to five. So for an FiO2, let's say 60%, uh, you expect a PaO2 of about 300, roughly roughly. Um, and this is just your uh, alveolar oxygen pressure. Of course, it depends on uh, your PiO2, which is your FiO2 that you're giving, barometric pressure minus your uh, water vapor pressure. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, your carbon dioxide, uh, what, what the carbon dioxide content already in your, in your alveoli. So you get a value of about 100. Um, Although the, your alveolar oxygen uh, pressure is usually not equal to your arterial oxygen um, because of certain VQ mismatch, uh, low FRCs, or functional residual capacity, even normally, because of uh, you know we're not we're, all our alveoli aren't all open uh, to this to the uh, extent uh, that um, allows 100% entry. Um, of, of your alveolar oxygen into your arterial oxygen, into your arterial, arterial system. So it is, is usually not exactly, they're not usually not exact values. Uh, to improve oxygenation, you increase functional residual capacity or your PEP and expiratory pressure and volume by applying continuous distending pressure. So this is your PEP. So as long as you expand your alveoli, you're, you'll allow more um, alveolar oxygen and therefore uh, uh, hopefully better um, uh, diffusion into the, uh, the pulmonary vasculature. So you increase mean airway pressure. So you can also increase peak inspiratory pressure, eye time, and improve your IE ratio uh, to, able, to be able to recruit atelectatic or poorly ventilated alveolar units. So therefore, you improve uh, VQ mismatch and you decrease uh, right to left shunting. You'll also improve lung compliance and decrease the work of breathing. So this figure just illustrates the um, significance or the importance of uh, improving uh, or increasing mean airway pressure to improve oxygenation. So you can um, actually increase mean airway pressure by increasing your PEP, your PIP, your eye time, even your expiratory time. So now these are ways to improve ventilation or your carbon dioxide. So uh, this is a simple formula where uh, the VT is your tidal volume. VA, of course, is alveolar ventilation. Uh, VD is uh, your dead space, and then, of course, your uh, rate or frequency of your mechanical ventilation. So for hypercarbia, you want to uh, increase alveolar ventilation. So you either increase uh, tidal volume or you increase your rate, or, of course, you decrease your uh, dead space so that you'll have uh, higher uh, alveolar ventilation and more removal of carbon dioxide. 
and uh, the opposite is true for hypocarbia. You have very, very low carbon dioxide. You decrease your tidal volume and or you decrease your rate so that uh, you'll retain more carbon dioxide. This is just a simple formula um, that we use just to determine the, uh, the desired uh, rate for the ventilator. For example, um, your actual CO2 is 60 and your actual rate is 30 and then your desired uh, carbon dioxide is 40. So your actual is 60 but your desired is 40 and your current rate is 30. So 60 times 30 is 1800 divided by 40. So that gives you 45 per minute. So from 30, just increase your rate to 45 and you should uh, get a CO2 of about 40. That's a very rough uh, estimate. So application of mechanical ventilation. This, this you can usually apply uh, ventilation even for patients with normal respiratory mechanics. Uh, for example, uh, you have post-op patients who do not have uh, pulmonary issues. You have patients with respiratory pump failure. So you just try to duplicate the physiologic uh, uh, rate and volume uh, of that uh, of that patient. Um, so for post-op patients, unless you know they were given narcotics and neuromuscular blocking drugs, then usually you just uh, give the physiologic uh, rate, let's say, the, of that patient for 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 rate for age, um, uh, tidal volume, the pressures, etc. So you can also uh, use normal respiratory mechanics for patients in shock. Uh, well, of course, initially you want to provide 100% FiO2, but the rate may may be lower, um, and uh, you also want to reduce metabolic expenditures for that patient. For patients with uh, stable head injuries, um, you, uh, without uh, increased ICP, you do not have to give uh, hyperventilation. Just maintain uh, normal CO2. Uh, normal FiO2 and you and although for patients with increased ICP you may do hyperventilation just to decrease the cerebral uh, vessel calibers and uh, decrease CO2 to about 35 to 40. So for patients with uh, lung disease uh, of course you tailor the uh, vent settings to compensate or to correct the issues with your uh, respiratory mechanics. So, uh, and occasionally you'll have, uh, of course, issues with obstructive lung disease, like in asthma or uh, restrictive lung disease, where you have issues with uh, alveolar injury, as in uh, pneumonia or ARDS. And then, uh, of course, be wary of the, that there are, of course, interspersed areas uh, with normal um, uh, airways, relatively normal airways, uh, interspersed with those uh, abnormal airways. So just be uh, cognizant of that fact. So when you initiate uh, mechanical ventilation, you choose certain um, modes. So for assist control mode, in general, this is applied when you prefer more strict control over the patient's breathing. Usually patient will be sedated or have neurological issues where you actually want uh, to control his breathing. For SIMV in general, this, is, this provides better patient compliance. It uh, allows pressure supported spontaneous breaths and is commonly used when we start to wean patients from assist control. We shift to SIMV uh, before we wean further. Other control modes are the pressure control, of course, and the volume control. So again, for pressure control, you have a preset pressure and time and uh, usually is more comfortable for the patient. Whereas for volume control, you set the volume and the flow. It's a little bit less comfortable and again, uh, less used if you have larger uh, endotracheal tube leaks around, around the ET or for uncuffed tubes. So finally, we go to initiating mechanical ventilation. So uh, we, of course, number one is to maintain adequate oxygenation. Um, so initially, especially in patients with shock, we give an FiO2 of 100%, always, especially in shock. And then you just wean as tolerated. No? 
um, because of, of course uh, you know the most common reasons going back is respiratory failure and most likely they will be needing as high an FiO2 as possible so always start with uh, FiO2 of 100% and then wean uh, quickly if you if you want to depending on your gases on your patient's condition with regards PEP, we usually start with an end expiratory pressure about four to five centimeters water. About four centimeters is uh, really normal, um, a, even in infants and, uh, and adults. Um, some of these uh, end expiratory pressures, of course, are higher in ARDS um, because of the uh, collapse and the stiffness of uh, the loss of compliance of the lung. Um, so we also use lower uh, PEP or end expiratory pressures for patients in asthma because already of their um, uh, auto PEEP that they generate um, because of the obstruction, of course, the ball valve effect, uh, your alveoli are already over distended. So we usually give either, you know, one or two uh, PEEP. Sometimes some doctors even do not apply PEEP, but that really depends on the patient. And then, of course, obviously, you assess for signs of adequate oxygenation, uh, good cardiac output. You measure your PO2 or, or your ABG. And as long as your PO2 is about uh, more than 70, uh, 80, then you may decrease your FiO2 to about 60% or less. You also decrease your PEP just to keep your, uh, your PAO2 about more than 70 millimeters mercury. So uh, this is, of course, uh, this deals with your functional residual capacity again. So um, if you want to increase your oxygenation, you may increase uh, end expiratory pressure. Therefore, you're also increasing your functional residual capacity because you're increasing your residual volume. So aside from oxygenation, you also want to maintain alveolar ventilation, which deals with carbon dioxide. So you select the normal physiologic uh, normal for age. Uh, obviously, for infants, it's higher, and then it goes lower as the age uh, goes higher. Um, usually, uh, tidal volume, we set it between 6 to 8 ml per kilogram, but then, you know, it can vary depending on the, on the illness. ARDS, sometimes we go lower. Even for COVID patients, we go lower. Um, for uh, for uh, patients who have very stiff lungs, we can increase tidal volume also. And then you select your eye time. So it depends on the illness. Usually, uh, the eye time would be anywhere from, you know, uh, or the IA ratio rather would be anywhere from 1 is to 2 to 1 is to 3. So you, you can decrease your inspiratory time based on your rate. Uh, you decrease your inspiratory time or increase the inspiratory time depending on whether this is a restrictive lung disease or an obstructive lung disease. And then by by uh, measuring your CO2, you, uh, you assess your ventilation. So take a look at your CO2. If your CO2 is very high, then we can increase alveolar ventilation by increasing tidal volume or increasing the rate. Um, if it's very low, then you decrease tidal volume or you decrease the rate. So just a uh, short summary of that. To affect oxygenation, you adjust FiO2, you increase that or decrease. Increase PEP to increase your FRC. Increase eye time if you like. Uh, increase inspiratory pressure. And then to affect ventilation or CO2, you either increase or you adjust rate and you adjust tidal volume. So just some of the um, example lung diseases. Now you have a restrictive lung disease characterized by decreased lung volume and compliance. You have low functional residual capacity, uh, VQ mismatching. So sometimes these are seen in patients who are obese uh, or with abdominal distension. They, they compress the, uh, the thoracic uh, cage or you have problems with alveolar filling and fibrosis, for example, in ARDS. So usually we will increase our uh, functional residual capacity by increasing your PEEP. So as was mentioned, you, you recruit alveoli by increasing your uh, mean airway pressure um, or your PEEP uh, mostly. No? So um, you also this also helps maintain surfactant activity you improve uh, VQ mismatching, but 
as was mentioned, avoid excessive PEP. So um, because you'll be compressing the pulmonary vessels, you'll, uh, you'll de de depress uh, venous return and therefore uh, depress cardiac output. So um, the, the optimal PEP is one that supports oxygenation with a non-toxic FiO2. So as long as you've already brought down your FiO2 to 60% or, or less, and then you have uh, a good cardiac output and venous return, and that's probably the best uh, uh, PEP. So for patients with asthma who have obstructive lung disease, there's of course an, a reduction in airflow um, and there's increased airway resistance causing air trapping, dynamic hyperinflation. You have prolonged time constant, meaning your, your expiratory time is much longer than your, your inspiratory time. So what you do is to maximize expiratory time to decrease end expiratory lung volume and intrinsic PEEP. You decrease also your minute ventilation, uh, controlled hypoventilation with physiologic tidal volume, and of course, a longer expiratory time. Um, again, your PEP, you must decrease your PEP because of the already the presence of, uh, of uh, auto PEEP uh, because of the... Um, the uh, obstruction uh, caused by the ball valve effect. So for those with uh, pneumonia with uh, focal lung tissue disease, uh, it results in hypoxia, hypoxia and uh, issues with diffusion, you have decreased surfactant and VQ mismatch. Um, you have to be also very careful with your PEP because uh, you may cause uh, volume trauma by applying too much PEP and uh, and and, and uh, causing volume trauma for the areas of the alveoli which are actually good. So when you have problems, uh, of course you always look at your patient, you listen to the patient, check the uh, pulse ox, your your cardiac monitor, uh, your ETCO2, X-ray. Uh, look at the alarms and then of course look at uh, the uh, mnemonics dope again uh, your displaced obstructed pneumothorax or equipment failure but then uh, luckily we'll have uh, someone to speak on uh, troubleshooting after my lecture so now how do we wean this patient from ventilator uh, you look at, of course, this, his patient, uh, the status of the patient in general. No? You check if he has adequate ventilatory reserve. Has he achieved or attained a favorable pulmonary mechanics, uh, acceptable parameters? Has the cause of the respiratory failure gone or is it getting better? Is he well oxygenated and ventilated in terms of your oxygen and carbon dioxide? Can your heart um, tolerate? The, the work the work of breathing uh, when when you shift this patient to spontaneous breathing and and if so then usually will uh, will wean uh, when the FIO2 by by decreasing your FIO2 until about 35 30 percent and uh, while maintaining your PAO2 about 60 or more um, and your carbon dioxide of course is within normal range um, sometimes we also uh, take a look at patient's maximum negative inspiratory capacity when it takes a, a very large inspira inspiratory breath. Uh, the needle or the gauge will, will go towards the negative side, so it will go to about negative 20 or negative 30. Then you know that uh, he has a very large inspiratory capacity. Um, and of course, obviously, the patient should have been in minimal respiratory support. So about uh, you decrease uh, to about an SIMV rate of about 10 or less sometimes and decrease your PEP until about maybe back to about four or five centimeters water. So as was mentioned, decrease your SIMV rate to about 10 to 12. Uh, for infants, do not wean to a CPAP or to the TPs or etc. because because of the very very small uh, diameter of the uh, of the ET tube, it'll be very difficult for the infant to breathe through that on his own, especially for prolonged periods of time. Whereas an older child might be able to tolerate 
if his ET is a little larger. So you can wean to a CPAP for the older child. But, you know, just maintain usually about two hours, etc. If his numbers are good, then you can go ahead and extubate. Also decrease your uh, distending pressure, your, your end expiratory pressure. So for infants, you about wean to about two to three, you know, four or five for the older child. So the criteria for uh, discontinuing support or uh, even ex extubating, so you have normal CO2 with uh, maximum negative inspiratory pressure if possible. Uh, an older child would have, always, of course, uh, also a normal CO2. Uh, you might be able to test uh, the ability to double his resting minute ventilation. So some causes of the failure of weaning, of course, is if the patient is still hypoxemic, you have still an elevated AADO2 with impaired exchange, probably because of uh, diffusion issues, uh, decreased mixed venous uh, oxygen content. You have hypoventilation because of respiratory mus muscle pump uh, failure and fatigue um, because maybe uh, continuing neurologic issues. Uh, malnutrition, metabolic derangements, and then the disuse atrophy uh, that we mentioned earlier. So before you extubate, of course, you have to make sure that the patient can control his uh, airway reflexes. He has a good gag and cough reflex. Of course, uh, patent airway, upper airway, there's a, <clears throat> a small leak around the tube, uh, maybe 15, 20 centimeters water um, with minimal oxygen requirement usually we don't go below 30 percent fio2 uh, even before extubation because anyway after extubation you'll either give a mask at five liters which will be of course higher than 30 percent or even for a cannula you might give maybe three four liters uh, that could also be around 30 percent anyways and then of course the the minimal rate uh, and minimal pressure support, and of course, the patient should be awake. So the actual process of extubation, so obviously you would have discontinued sedation already and made, made sure that the patient is fully awake. Um, just make sure to prepare uh, equipment, your suction machine, your monitors are ready, and then just in case you may need to re-intubate this patient, so just have your new ET, the ringoscope, all the other requirements for intubation ready at the bedside. Uh, you'll have, of course, your mask, your tubings, your, your, your oxygen, of course. Just make sure you prepare that those equipments. And then you, um, before you can suction, give positive pressure ventilation, uh, and then make sure the saturations are good, and then just pull out the ET, then apply your mask or cannula, and uh, stay at the bedside, just reassess your oxygenation, perfusion, you know, patient's still awake, just suction his mouth if there's a little secretion, etc. And that's it. Congratulations, you have ventilated this patient well and eventually successfully extubated him likewise. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's our first speaker, Dr. Alvin Florentino on basics of mechanical ventilation. I'm sure you'd want to interact with our first speaker, but don't you worry, that time will come if you want your answers or you want your questions answered. There'll be on a Q&A after the second speaker's lecture. But for the meantime, we would like to invite you for quiz number one. Welcome to slido.com, all right? There's a QR code, flash on screen. Use your mobile phone to answer. Go to the phone browser and type slido.com or scan the QR code flashed on screen in order to go to slido.com. Enter the pin code flashed on screen and input your complete name once again. It's your complete name, all right, as a username. Three questions will be asked based on the topic delivered. The top three participants with the highest accumulated scores will be declared as winners of the round. Winners with incomplete names will be disqualified. And the next participant with the highest score and complete name will be awarded as a winner. 
Token per winner, we are giving away two boxes of Easy Fit multivitamins worth 710 pesos. So please join us. Again, we would want to emphasize this, your complete name. Are you ready for the Slido quiz? Quiz number one. Ladies and gentlemen, do stand by for the questions we are preparing. Okay. Hope you're doing good. We'd like to welcome everybody. Type in your complete name. So to our more than 3,000 participants, by the way, we are also live on YouTube. This has been powered by Dalex Pharma International. Our quiz master is Usher, and we are still looking and counting out your names. All right, looking at the names. Here we go. You got your full names. That's good. That's perfect. And counting and more. All right. This is just the first quiz. Here we go. Question number one and counting. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. 15 seconds over for question number one. The right answer is, look at the screen. If you have answered letter B, congratulations to you. First question, that is, we got two more questions coming up. Are you ready for second? the second question? Here we go. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, question number two. Did you get it right? Let's see the answers. On this page, you see that the right answer is letter C. If you're on letter C, congratulations to you. We got the last and third question coming up. The last and the third question. Okay, here we go. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, that was 15 seconds for each question. Question number three on this page, let's try to see. Did you answer it right? Letter D. You got letter D, you got it right correctly. 59% of you answered letter D. So, our winners this afternoon for two boxes of Easy with Multivitamins. We got Mary Elisa De La Rosa, congratulations. Antoinette Therese Dinglasson and Alejandro Vertigar Jr. Top three names, all right? So, uh, so please be informed. We got our prizes ready for you. Congratulations to you guys. So, going back to what you've been waiting for. So, standing by to our AVPs. It's next online.
Our second speaker is a graduate of Bachelor of Science in Respiratory Therapy at the University of Perpetual Health System, Laguna. He had experience uh, working as a respiratory therapist in Daman Medical Complex, Ministry of Health, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He has been our respiratory therapist at the Philippine Children's Medical Center and holds the position of training officer at the Pediatric Pulmonology Division of the said hospital. He has handled several ventilators in his career. To name a few, Puritan Bennett, VIP Bird and Sterling, Galileo, Sequis, Drager, Parapat, Hamilton, Avia, and a lot more. This afternoon, he will talk about troubleshooting in mechanical ventilation. Mr. Jerickson A. Bayani. Good afternoon. Today, I'm going to discuss to you the troubleshooting in mechanical ventilation. My learning objectives for this topic is to know the different ventilator alarms, their causes, and how to troubleshoot them. To know the respiratory formulas that can help manage your ventilated patient. To learn about the infection control during mechanical ventilation to determine when to perform preventive maintenance in a mechanical ventilator. Mechanical ventilator alarms are used to warn of changes in patient status. All alarms should be set according to the patient's condition. For patient safety alarm, it should never be disabled. This afternoon, I will discuss some essentials alarm in mechanical ventilator. Back in the days where the ventilators are like this, the most common alarm that you may see is your high pressure and your low pressure alarm. Your high pressure alarm is triggered when it reaches your alarm limit. If this happens, you must set your alarm limit plus 5 to 10 from your preset pressure settings. If the alarm still persists, your potential problems are excessive secretions, you must suction your patient's kink endotracheal tube, align your ventilator circuit properly, pneumothorax, you may consider chest tube insertion if this high pressure alarm persists. If the patient bites the tube, consider placing an oral airway or a bite block. Low pressure alarm. It is triggered when it reaches the low pressure limit. If this happens, the low the alarm limit must be set minus five from your preset pressure settings. This low pressure alarm is also activated by leaks in ventilator circuit. Test tube leaks will necessitate readjustment and deflated or ruptured endotracheal tube and your patient disconnection. Nowadays, the new ventilators have microchip system that contains different alarms. This will aid the clinicians and respiratory therapists to determine the patient's problem. This is an example of your uh, transport ventilator. Now, these are the alarms that you may encounter. Uh, using this kind of ventilator. Mm -hmm. High peak pressure alarm. Sound whenever the preset high peak, peak threshold is exceeded. Partial or complete occlusion of circuit, water in circuit, patient's cups and sneezes, and probably because of your patient lung compliance. High peak pressure can appear to both ventilation, pressure and volume. During volume ventilation, a patient with a problem is in lung compliance, such as pediatric uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, you may shift your mode to pressure control. This will help you control the pressure that the ventilator is giving to the patient. Also, it, it, the damage to the lungs can be prevented by shifting your uh, mode to pressure. Low peak pressure alarm. Partial or complete disconnection to your patient and circuit leak. 
to troubleshoot this, you should check the patient circuit for leak disconnection. When checking for a leak, first start on the inspiratory line from the ventilator through humidifier and to the patient connection, which is your artificial airway. And then go to the expiratory line, going back to the exhalation valve of the ventilator. That is how you systemic, systemic type of uh, checking your patient leak. For your circuit occlusion alarm, it regards when the inspiratory or expiratory limb of the patient circuit becomes sufficiently occluded. In response to this alarm, you should do two things. Check the circuit or exhalation bulb for condensation. Check for water in your circuit. For your high exhale minute ventilation, minute volume, triggered when the patient is tachypneic or exceeds the set respiratory rate. What do we do when we see this? Check your patient and search for the cause of the tachypnea. Sedation may be required when necessary. Low exhaled minute volume, triggered when the circuit has a leak. Action point when this alarm is triggered. Check, of course, for the leak. Try to reposition your endotracheal tube if necessary. It can be dislodged or probably out by this moment. High tidal volume alarm. It triggered when the tidal volume reaches the upper limit settings of your alarm. This is due to patient scoffing or when the patient is uh, or have spontaneously breathing. What do we do when this is heard? You have to check your alarm limit settings. For your low exhale tidal volume, these alarms happens when your exhale tidal volume preset drops below your preset volume. Potential problems are leak in the circuit, leak in the patient artificial airway, misaligned endotracheal tube, Decreased patient lung compliance, probably because of your infection. Decreased airway resistance due to bronchospasm or excessive amount of secretions. If the cause of the leak is the artificial airway, then you have to reintubate a properly sized tube. If there is an infection, give your antibiotics. If there is a decrease in your airway resistance, give bronchodilators, and do pulmonary rehabilitation. The low PIP alarm. Triggered when an ET size is used too small. When this happens, check your ET size and set the alarm uh, minus 2 to 4 below your preset PEP. Your high respiratory rate. Triggered when patient exceed the alarm settings. Your response to this problem should be the RR limit should be set plus 5 to 10 over your set backup rate. It can be uh, caused by your sensitivity. It may be too high, probably water in the circuit, and bronchospasm. When there is a bronchospasm, do bronchodilator therapy. For your low high FiO2 alarm, check the gas source to ensure that the ventilator is connected to a pressure oxygen source. Ensure that the FiO2 alarm is set properly. Recalibrate the internal external oxygen sensor of your ventilator. This is an example of your oxygen sensor. It may be placed inside your ventilator or outside your ventilator. Loss of oxygen or loss of air. Loss of oxygen uh, probably because of your empty tank or disconnected or low PSI. It triggered if the wall oxygen supply to the ventilator drops below 18. And same with the air supply. However, patient may still continue ventilated by the air supply via internal compressor of the ventilator. The universal color code for oxygen are green and white. The universal color code for air is black and yellow. When this happens, 
you may call your biomed engineering department to check oxygen and air supply in your hospital. Preset alarm limits. These are the alarm that we cannot adjust. For example, the pressure of your gas source like oxygen tank and your compressed air. The battery alarm will trigger if you have a defective internal battery problem. This is crucial when there is a problem, when there is a power interruption in your hospital. This will allow the ventilator to still ventilate for one to two hours, provided that your internal battery is properly working. For your vent in operative alarm, during this time, the machine is not ventilating. It may be cause your problem, the problem may be the power source or your gas supply. So how do we troubleshoot this? Turn the ventilator off and restart it again. If the ventilator fails to operate properly, tag it for a maintenance check and replace it with another ventilator. The transducer fault alarm. This, uh, this is an example of your transducer uh, device. This error means that a power adapting device is not working properly. It can be connection problem such as ventilator tubing connected to the transducer. For a voltage problem, wherein there's a lack of voltage being applied to the transducer, unplug and plug the ventilator from the power line again. If all the problems are fixed and the alarm still appears, the transducer itself may be the problem. In that case, you need or you have to replace the transducer with a new one. So we, I, we highly suggest that you have an extra transducer in your uh, department each ventilator. If the ventilator fails to operate properly, tag it for a maintenance check and replace it with another ventilator. Remember that if you will change a ventilator, you must hook the patient to a manual resuscitating bag with an HEPA filter. For a high nasal CPAP pressure alarm, this comes with your non-invasive ventilation. The cause are patient circuit occlusion, water in circuit, and patient interaction. So number one, check the patient circuit. Check the RAM cannula size, if it's properly fit to the patient or the infant. This is an example of your RAM cannula and its size from zero uh, to three. For your low end CPAP pressure, Disconnect, uh, this is caused by disconnected circuit, uh, circuit leak. So check your patient circuit again. Check the RAM cannula if it's properly fits to the nose of your patient. For non-invasive ventilation, these ventilators, these high-end mechanical ventilators can provide both invasive and non-invasive ventilation. These are example of a ventilator that provides a dedicated mode for a non-invasive ventilation that can be activated by a calibration. Also, you can do or give non-invasive ventilation during transport by using this type of ventilator. This troubleshooting table is very applicable to old model types of machine. For example, your ventilator have still have a manometer for your motor for your monitoring pressure if the problem is a rattling of needle of the manometer the problem is water in circuit so you just have to drain the water in the circuit if auto pip is present during this time it must be wet diaphragm or presence of crystal deposits in the expiratory valve system just replace the diaphragm wash the expiratory valve if the leaks at uh, low pressure leak, check some uh, check your leaks. For high pressure water condensate, kinking or biting into tube, presence of risk secretions. Your actions drain refill, drain the water. Sorry, place the bite guard and suction your patient. For the alarm system, 
If the red alarm persists, it requires immediate action. If yellow alarm means that the alarm happened and the ventilator is ventilating properly. Green light means no alarm. The general characteristic of an alarm systems are as follows. It exhibits visual light and signals that you may see in your uh, uh, monitor panel. They have audible signals with a screen message, warnings indicating specific alarm condition. Ventilators now have a very distinguished alarm system organized accordingly to priority as high, medium, and low. These are the examples of a ventilator alarms and what are the actions have been taken. So this uh, table showing you the high priority alarm signals, their causes and actions to be taken. This high priority alarm should be attended to the clinician by the clinicians or respiratory therapists as soon as possible. The medium priority alarm, which means that they are not urgent, but this should be still be addressed to avoid potential problem to your, to your patient. And lastly, this, is table, this table is the low priority alarm. So there is a high frequency alarm, ventilator alarms reaches one figure limit within 30 seconds. Action should be taken, adjust your alarm limits accordingly. Now, let's go to the level of urgency of your alarms. For level one, this is the highest priority. It is immediately life-threatening. So what uh, alarms should be, uh, you should see this moment. Of course, your ventilatory inoperative, transducer fault, lost oxygen, and lost air. Because during this uh, moment, the ventilator uh, is not uh, working properly. Number two uh, level, life-threatening if the problem persists. This means uh, if you did not uh, solve the problem during high pressure and low pressure, low PEEP, it may cause harm to the patient if this one persists. And number three is low level uh, urgency, non-life threatening. It should be a low FIO2, high respiratory rate, high BE, and high BP. Now let's go to the respiratory formulas. So for minute ventilation is the total sum of your volume delivered over a minute or also known as your total ventilation. Typical mechanical uh, minute ventilation for term infant is 240 to 360 mils per kg. Uh, if your ventilator is not displaying uh, this uh, type of uh, monitoring, you may manually use this using these uh, formulas. So these are your mean airway pressure uh, formula, your exhale tidal volume formula, your corrected tidal volume formula. And let's go to the uh, rapid shallow breathing index. So RSPI is a tool used to help clinicians to win the patient from a mechanical ventilator. It is appropriate for most ICU patients. However, there are certain patients population in whom the use of RSBI may or may not accurately predicting successful winning. Recent studies shows that rapid shallow breathing index has been used as a prediction tool for winning adult patients. But for pediatric patients, it is still an area of controversy. This retrospective study published in June 2020 shows that 34.9% patients were successfully extubated. 59.3 patients had successful extubation with the with the use of non-invasive ventilation, and only 5.8% patients suffered from extubation failure with the use of your RSBI as a tool of winning. The study concluded that pediatric patients who suffer from extubation failure usually have higher RSBI index compared to the patient who have successfully extubation. For your ventilator circuit, Choose the right size of your tubing appropriate for your ventilator circuit compliance. 
If you have a patient less than 5 kilograms below, use neonatal tubings. If it's uh, 5 kilos up to 10 kilos, use pediatric tubings. While if it's more than 10 kilos, use adult and volume tubings. Back in the days that the ventilator is categorized to volume and pressure ventilators, we use this algorithm to determine which ventilator are we going to use to that patient. So here you will see, you will determine the body weight of the patient first. If it's below 10 kilograms, you use pressure ventilation. If it's above 10 kilograms, you use volume ventilation. And these are your initial settings for that. In our pre present time, due to the rapid advancement in the technology, ventilators can now provide both pressure and volume ventilation. This allows a single vent machine to ventilate all types of patient, just a single, just a push of a button. Let's go to the infection control. According to the infection control and hospital epidemiology published in August 2014, one of the strategies to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia in acute care hospital includes sorry, changing the ventilator circuit, water filter when they visibly uh, soiled or mechanically malfunction. However, during this pandemic, we have established health protocols to prevent VAP or uh, ventilator-acquired pneumonia and prevent the transmission of COVID-19. This include routinely changing of our ventilator circuit, bacteria filters, and humidifier. Drain water from the ventilator circuit and water traps must be done four to six hours, every four to six hours. Draining the water at the back of your ventilator on your compressed air water trap should be done daily. Change of patient circuit, humidifier, and bacterial filter must change every seven days. Use humidifier with inline water refilling to prevent disconnection of tube from the humidifier when refilling sterile water. For your humidifier fluids, use only sterile water. Do not use distilled or non-sterile water because this may affect condensation to your water circuit. Always wear level 4 PPE. Okay, level 4 PPE include bunny suit, N95 mask, gloves, and face shield. Always wear this when doing uh, drain refill of your ventilator circuit. So we use inline or auto fit inline humidifier when refilling the humidifier. So this is the humidifier and it is hooked here in your sterile water. In pre-pandemic and during pandemic period, when we refill the water to the ventilator, we bypass the inspiratory line from the machine to the humidifier. During this pandemic, we use uh, inline auto feed into our humidifier. We are uh, pre-pandemic, we change the humidifier water every four hours to prevent uh, PAP or as needed. During pandemic, this is not applicable because uh, you will create or you will generate aerosol uh, particles when you disconnect the ventilator to your uh, a patient. Drain the water from the ventilator circuit every four hours and change up your tubings every seven days. Same with today pandemic. Change filter and humidifier, same today. Okay. We do every we do all this uh, during this pandemic. And even before, before the pandemic, we change the tubings every seven days. Cleaning the sur external surface. All external surfaces of the ventilator can be wiped clean with isopropyl alcohol, chlorhexidine gluconate 4%. These compounds must be diluted 
by volume of water. You should not uh, use this directly to your ventilator without diluting it to a volume of water. For the cleaning of your monitor panel, harsh, do not use harsh chemical solvents, acid-based or alkaline substances, a substance with ammonia. Do not spray uh, cleaning product directly onto the screen of your ventilator. Use 80% isopropyl alcohol. Apply a soap cloth with which uh, to wipe the screen of your ventilator. Now let's go to the basis of preventive maintenance. Okay, safety, quality, regulatory compliance, and periodic training of your staff is necessary on preventing, on uh, having a preventive maintenance program to your ventilators. For your preventive maintenance. Uh, it's like uh, preventing a uh, it's like preventing uh, preventive maintenance. It's like uh, associated with your car uh, maintenance. For example, uh, your ventilator, your ventilator must be checked by the biomed every five thousand hours or annually, whichever comes first. For your oxygen cell sensor, it must be checked every six months or whenever the event prompts FIO to failure. Take note that oxygen cell or sensor will last only for six months upon uh, use or unsealed from uh, its box. Flow sensor must be replaced annually. Exhalation bulb must be changed every six months for PRN or as needed due to wear and tear. Internal battery should be checked every three months to ensure it is still working properly. Heater base must be quarterly checked and calibrated to ensure the accuracy of the temperature that you that your heater base is giving. These are the components checked based on hours use. It's like a it's like a car. Uh, if you would like to check your ma car manual, you may see uh, this kind of number of hours. Uh, compared to the car, it's up a number of kilometers. So number of hours for the ventilator parts, for 250 hours, you need to change your fan filter and cooling fan filter because this may cause heat to the ventilator if you do not change it 250 hours. 2,500 hours, that comes with your uh, preventive maintenance kit and 10,000 hours comes with your preventive maintenance kit. Performance testers. So under this is qualitative tests, electrical safety tests, component check based on our space, like I showed the previous slide, cleaning and calibration, and quantitative tests. For your qualitative tests, you need to check your front panels. So it may be your uh, indicator or your display, control knobs, switches, accessories such as exhalation bulbs, and water traps for your mount if it's uh, properly installed the screw is properly attached for the brakes it's properly working and your for casing if it's there's no damage on it at the back of your ventilator you must see your ac module your on and off switch your air smart connector your oxygen sensor, oxygen host connection, and external battery fuse. For your electrical safety test, you must check your ground cell resistance, leakage current. This may prevent you from uh, having electrical problem on your mechanical ventilator. Please refer to your biomed engineering department on this electrical safety test because they are the one who knows this uh, better than us. For your quantitative test, this must be done every time you use the ventilator to your patient to assure the quality of the machine. Some they call this self-calibration, some ventilator they call it auto-test, some are uh, EST or extended self-test. 
So this will check your leak test, your circuit compliance, your oxygen sensor. All of this must be passed during this test. Otherwise, your ventilator is not ready to use if there's if there are if they are all failed. For my last slide, the benefits take uh, take that in mind. The benefits of preventive maintenance are as follows: it assures our equipment performance within specific limits for our patient safety and identify the patient risk. That help us find hidden problems which are we not observed during normal ventilation. And it compliance to the regulatory requirement of, our, of your hospital. It leads to a predictive maintenance and cost saving and easier to budget. Because if you do not uh, do this to your ventilator, it may deteriorate soon or you will no longer use it. So that will be, uh, may cause a lot of problem. And that would be all. Thank you very much. Okay, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jerickson A. Bayani on the trouble shooting and mechanical ventilation. I know you would want to have to want to ask questions and uh, for the clarifications, but then again, you can do that later after this quiz. We are giving away two boxes of EasyVit multivitamins worth 710 pesos. So welcome to quiz number two. Welcome to our Slido event. Our quiz master is ready. Use your mobile phone to answer. Go to, go to phone browser and type slido.com or scan the QR code. The QR code flashed on screen in order to go to slido.com. Enter the pin code flashed on screen and input your complete name as username. Three questions will be asked based on the topic delivered. The uh, top three participants with the highest accumulated scores will be declared as the winners of the round. Winners with incomplete names will be disqualified and the next participant with the highest score and the complete name will be awarded as a winner. Okay, are you ready, my dear good friends, for two boxes of EasyBit multivitamins? We are counting in, type in your name, we would like to say hi to all our participants, to uh, more or less 3,000 participants from all over the world. Hello to our friends in Cambodia, French Polynesia, from Makati, Davao, Bohol, and the rest of the country, and from all over the world. Good afternoon, or say good morning, good day to you. Oh, we are looking at your names. That's very good. Do participate again. It's your complete name that we're looking for. This is the second quiz for two boxes of Easy Fit. By the way, we are also live on Facebook and YouTube channel. Oh, here's number one. Go. 15 seconds. Question number one. Question number one and counting, ladies and gentlemen. And here we go. The correct answer. If you got the answer right, count yourself in. But we got two more questions. Letter B is correct. For 40% of you got it right. All right, are you ready for question number two? And here we are. Question number two, 15 seconds. And that's it for question number two. Time is up. Let's see who got it right. Observing. Looking at letter A, 58% of you got it right. Congratulations to you guys. Now we got one last, the final question. Question number three for 15 seconds and counting. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. On this page, let's see who's got it right. 
And so which letter could it be? Are you on the winning team? Letter C, 71% of you got it right. For the 71 percenters, congratulations to you. Now, let's tally this one. Number one, Antoinette Clarice Dinglasan. Familiar name, Mary Grace Kalaluan and Catherine May Dimakali. Amtig. Congratulations to you, ladies. All right. So, claim your prize. Two boxes of easy fit coming up for you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the moment you've all been waiting for, let's go live on the Q&A portion. We would like to call back live on screen Dr. Alvin C. Florentino, our first speaker, our second speaker, Sir Jerickson A. Bayani, and our moderator, Dr. Maria Teresa Lorenzo. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, so we are really international. From We have friends from Australia, Cambodia, French, Polynesia. Hello. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. And good afternoon, and everyone. In our country, from Palawan to Holo. I hope you are all having a smooth ride and at the same time have learned a lot from our speakers. So we heard about the clinical significance as well as the technical side of mechanical ventilation. So I, I know you, are all, you all agree with me that it is a timely topic. It is the it thing no? since the time of pandemic. We do realize that we all should at least learn the basics of mechanical ventilation. All right, let's go to our favorite part, the Q&A. I'm sure Dr. Alvin and Mr. Bayani are both eager to deal with your questions. So alternate. The first question is uh, for Dr. Alvin, when is Miller or the straight or Macintosh blade or the curve use? Is the age an indication or the weight? And in relation to that, uh, do we... Where do we put our linen? It is under the head or under the shoulder? Dr. Alvin? <laughs> Thank you for that, um, Afel. Thank you for that question. Um, so like I said in the lecture, the Miller blades or the straight blades are usually used for the younger uh, patients. Now, there is no hard and fast rule regarding the age. Uh, the Mac blades or the curved blades are usually used for the older kids where you uh, insert it all the way to the vallecula, you in, uh, uh, lift up the vallecula and you uh, lift up also the epiglottis and see the airway. Um, the, about the shoulder, about the, the towel roll or whatever, um, it's best placed, of course, under the shoulder, actually under the neck. Uh, the occiput is still pretty large. So um, uh, if you place it in the occiput, especially for the younger infants, this may uh, even cause a bit of uh, a flexion of the neck. So I, it's, it's really best to put it under the shoulder just to provide uh, more um, extension. Okay, uh, there is a specific questions for Jerry. Uh, the first question is, is there an indication in the machine that will inform us that we exceeded the capacity for the patient? And uh, will we expect an alarm for this? Is there a specific number also that will tell us that we are overboard? Uh, I think, Doctora, for the, for the question is that there are no specific uh, prompt or the, the machine that's saying that you are, the ventilator having problem to your patient. It should be always, it is categorized such as, uh, for example, your high pressure alarm. Your high pressure alarm should always be set plus 5 to 10 cm water uh, from your preset uh, pressure settings. Like uh, that one, the one that I saw uh, with Dr. Oikwes, uh, he's saying that you should not set 80 cm water exactly because you are allowing the ventilator to give that amount of pressure to your patient. It should be uh, set appropriately to the uh, ventilator settings. Okay, thank you, Jerick. Uh, for there are several questions regarding this. So, uh, pag isahin ko na. Uh, for teenagers, which mode of ventilation is recommended? I think they are talking about the. Is it recommended to do to use volume or pressure, and why? 
Uh, I think this is for Dr. Alvin. Yeah, um, well, uh, the, again, the, there is no hard and fast rule. Um, you may shift from one to the other depending on the status of the patient, but usually the larger infants or the larger children, uh, the heavier children and the bigger children, uh, we will most commonly use volume control. Um, this is in particular because of uh, certain mechanics. Uh, the tube that you're usually using will be uh, cuff tubes. Um, although there are cuff tubes, even smaller uh, cuff tubes, but the older children, um, uh, the adult adolescents will most commonly use a cuff tube. And uh, by using a volume control, uh, you do not lose any of the volume that you want to give to the periphery out through the side of the endotracheal tube, because since you've expanded the, the balloon of your, the cuff of your endotracheal tube, you will not allow that much leak. Um, so uh, by using volume control, you'll be able to deliver all the volume uh, that you want to give for that patient. Thank you, sir. Again, for Jerry, how do we check for the negative inspiratory pressure in infants? Is there a ventilator maneuver that we have to deal with? Yeah, uh, there is a ventilator uh, button that you can use. And there's a specific mode, or sorry, there's a specific uh, button that you can use, uh, a maneuver that can uh, determine the negative inspiratory pressure. That is inspiratory hold. You can see that to all the ventilator right now in the market, the high-end ventilator, they can, uh, they are providing this uh, uh, maneuver. Okay, uh, again for Dr. Alvin, there are two to three questions regarding this, sir. Uh, can we increase the ventilator rate for example, in a teenager, the, the rate is already at 40. The ventilatory rate is already at 40. And that is to address the hypercapnia. For example, the blood gas showed that it is still um, more than 50. So do we address this by increasing the RR? Yeah, number one, um, this is already, you know, sort of supraphysiologic for a, uh, for a teenager. Uh, respiratory rate of 40. Um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, that formula regarding alveolar ventilation. So uh, this, uh, this is the uh, uh, um, product of your tidal volume and your ventilatory rate. So if you've already needed to increase your rate, but still uh, you have hypercapnia, uh, you want to increase alveolar ventilation and blow off your CO2, then uh, use your tidal volume instead. So increase your tidal volume instead. And you should increase alveolar ventilation and therefore blow off the CO2 that you want to blow off. So in other words, it is not the, just the RR that we can maneuver, yes, right, sir? There are other volume parameters that we can uh, deal with. Yes, bro. Um, for Jeric, if the vent is with internal compressor, do we still have to hook to the wall? I mean, in the medical air source, and why? Yeah, yes, Doctor. You should uh, hook. You should hook it to the medical uh, air source because uh, using the internal compressor will uh, it will wear uh, what do you call this? It will uh, deteriorate or it will uh, damage as early as you you use it. So it it is only used as a, a backup uh, compressor to your ventilator once the uh, your supply of air or your uh, medical air uh, will shut down. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, sir, uh, I think this is more for you because there is a specific disease that uh, involves uh, with this uh, question. Uh, in patients with low compliance, is it better to give them high pressure, just like PIP or PIP maybe? And in relation to that, sir, uh, do we use zero PEP in asthma? 
Okay, so the first question is um, for patients uh, for diseases that have low lung compliance, you're probably going to need a pretty high uh, ins uh, positive inspiratory pressure um, or volume um, because of the low compliance just to improve uh, oxygenation and increase uh, lung volume. Um, for the second question, um, in patients with asthma, of course, this, uh, these patients are assumed to have auto PEEP already. So I think the question is, should we still uh, provide uh, PEEP for the ventilator? Um, my, my answer will be, um, you provide uh, just a little end expiratory pressure um, because you're, you know that uh, not all the alveoli might be over distended. Uh, so you also want to uh, provide a distension to some of the alveoli which have collapsed, maybe because of um, mucus uh, plugging, et cetera. Um, and at the same time, you don't want to give too much uh, or to add to, add to the auto peep uh, and cause over distension. You might cause a decrease uh, uh, blood flow back to the heart and uh, subsequently decrease in cardiac output. So just be very careful with your with that auto peep function. Yes, suppose especially sir, when patients also have concomitant pneumonia, so you really cannot uh, decrease the PEP to zero. Yes. Number. yes. yes. Okay. Uh, again, for Jeric, uh, specific kasi to sa'yo, Jeric, eh, they yes, ask no. this, uh, is there a difference when you use distilled water or is still uh, is sterile water in our humidifier? Uh, yes, Doctor. Uh, as we observe in our practice, uh, when we use distilled water to our humidifier, the, the air uh, condensate rapidly and compared to sterile water. And we, we experience, we observe the patient produce a lot of secretions by using distilled water to our humidifier. And specifically, uh, sterile water is available in the hospital and distilled water should buy outside the hospital. So, and much, uh, uh, much cheaper, the sterile water compared to distilled. Okay, thank you. And it is also affected by environmental temperature, right? Yung... Yes, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think this is an adult physician, sir. Uh, in adults, uh, we they, they set up the FiO2 initially to 100%. And then how do we do it in infants and children? Do we do the same? Yeah, um, especially if the disease calls for it, kumbaga, then you can uh, start with an FiO2 of 100%. We usually start with an FiO2 of 100% because more commonly we see uh, pneumonias uh, are still number one and then respiratory distress and failure. So naturally you'll have uh, hypoxia and hypoxemia. So you'd want to bump up your FiO2 as high as possible. Um, also in patients in shock, then you'd want to provide as much FiO2 and oxygen supply to the blood and to the tissues as high as possible. Um, of course, obviously, when, when the patient doesn't need it anymore or you're monitoring your blood gas, you're monitoring your saturations, your hemoglobin, then you need it. Thank you, sir. Again, there is a specific question for, for Jeric and... Um, it deals with, um, it says here, uh, talking about the tubings, which one is the, which one of the tubing, is there a specific tubings uh, per age of the patient? Like for example, is there a specific um, uh, ventilator tubings for infants, for children and for adults? And in connection with that, uh, which one is inspiratory and which one is expiratory? Where do we put our nebulization? Where we, do we do our nebulization? Where do we see the filter? Sorry, yes, Jerry, can <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Doctor. Uh, in regards with the circuit, you should always base on your patient body weight. Uh, if your patient is uh, less than five kilo, definitely you will use neonatal tubings. If it's the one that I said on my slides, if you have a pediatric patient, you should use, uh, for your patient is a uh, five to 10 kilogram, you should use uh, pediatric tubings. While more than 10 kilograms, you should use uh, adult tubings. Now, in regards with the, I think the one they're asking is the 
the parts of the circuit. The yeah. usually the inspiratory line. Yun, is, diba? Usually the yes, way yung naka. Yes, usually the inspiratory line is color uh, blue, while the expiratory line is color uh, white. In some circuit, they are all the same, like blue and uh, white. So it's up. It's, it doesn't matter which one is the color. It's the color coded. The important is you know where is the inspiratory line and the expiratory line. Now the nebulization part, you put it proximally in the ET tube, uh, elbow, and your ventilator. It should be near to the ET tube of the patient, precisely because the medication should go immediately to the patient lungs. Rather than putting the nebulizer on your circuit, it will go to the circuit only. Okay, so diretso, no? It's not in the inspiratory or the expiratory too. Mm. Yes. Uh, the where do we see? Do we usually see the um, the filter? Where do you connect the filter? The Kasi filter should especially be... now that is COVID time, parang lahat should be ano filtered. Although even before, di ba? We lagi namang may filter. Yes, doctor. We always put uh, the filter in the inspiratory line and the expiratory line from the machine and going back to the machine at the end of the inspiratory and the expiratory line. Am I correct when I say that you know that it is the inspiratory tube when it is connected to the humidifier? Yes, doctor. The... Exactly. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Next question, I think. Um, dami question. Ah, is there a standard uh, winning protocol? Like, for example, um, which one do we do first? Do we usually do the FIO2 first? Uh, do we do alternate? Or can we do it all together? How about when to do the PIP or the tidal volume, the PEP? I think this is more for Dr. Alvin. Okay. Thank you uh, for that question again. Again, um, th there is no uh, you know, hard and fast rule. Um, as long as uh, your patient has already improved, let's say in terms of his oxygenation and his ventilation, uh, you're ready to wean off. We will usually start with an FI with the FiO2. Um, looking at his X-rays, looking at his blood gas, we start with an FiO2. Even before we we decide to actually wean this patient, we'd want to wean off the FiO2 to, to at least 60% or below 60%. Uh, because of the fact that you know 60% and higher would be toxic to the lung. So even if even before we, we decide to wean, we'd want to decrease the FiO2 to 60% if the patient is tolerated and if the clinical status requires it. Um, thereafter, we can start with FiO2 and then you can even alternate you know, your, your inspiratory pressure. Uh, PEEPs will usually be at around four or five, you can keep it there uh, until you actually extubate this patient. Uh, so you usually uh, uh, alternate between FiO2 and then your rate. So you can do, you know, every hour, uh, you know, FiO2, and then the next hour you're doing your rate, the next hour you're doing FiO2. It's really up to the patient and, and, and your blood gases, your physical examination, saturations, and all that. So in other words, sir, we really have to correlate it all with the patient. Yes, so always. The patient is the most important one, and there is always. really no hard and fast rule. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I think uh, this is for both of you. How would you differentiate uh, pressure of PIP and uh, pressure support, or PS, in patients receiving SIMV plus pressure support? Or do they coexist? Um, the PIP is what the machine will give. It's, it's the inspiratory pressure that is the pressure that the machine will give uh, your inspiratory pressure above your PEP. Uh, whereas uh, the pressure support is the, the, the amount of flow that the patient will receive when he takes a spontaneous breath during your SIMV. Um, so it's, it's different because the PIP is a machine provided uh, pressure and uh, the pressure support is 
what is uh, uh, provided to the patient during a spontaneous breath. Did I answer your question? Uh, you might have a, a, a different uh, yeah. answer, Jerry. I agree with you, sir. Jerry? Yeah, meron ka yeah I totally mayroon? agree with Dr. Uh, Alvin Frontena, what he said. And I just want to remind, when we uh, win the patient, for example, when we win the patient from CPAP PSB, we should uh, zero the PSB or pressure support when the times to uh, extubate the patient or try PP swinging to the patient. We, we, uh, we suggest to uh, turn it off kasi nakakalimutan minsan po, Doc. Mm -mm. Okay, we only have five minutes remaining. I, I, I have this question um, regarding COVID. Uh, she, he's just asking about, for COVID-19 pediatric patients, what, was, what is our prognosis? I, I think uh, for patients requiring mechanical ventilation, have we experienced a hard, uh, venti hard time ventilating these patients? I think that is more of the question. Uh, sorry, sir, but this is for you. <laughs> sir, naka mute ka po. Hey, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, for COVID-19 pediatric patients, what is the, our prognosis? I think he, he, they only want to know if we, have a, we were having a hard time ventilating these patients or yeah. is there a difference comparing to adults? Yeah, um, you would expect that um, the, the children would have a better uh, prognosis, of course, um, because um, not all of them, or at least a l lower percentage of them, go into severe respiratory distress and become critical, uh, re uh, eventually ending up in ARDS. Although that happens, um, we had one patient who was had a severe pneumonia, but was eventually uh, extubated and successfully uh, went home. Naman. So, luckily, we 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 were we were lucky with that patient. Actually, same here, sir. We also yeah. are fortunate that we were able to extubate a majority yeah. of our patients who are confirmed COVID nineteen. Okay, I am very sorry to inform everyone that as much as we would like to entertain your other questions um we all have to end uh, this is time for us to end this webinar and so i'm sure you are now more confident to set up your mechanical ventilator however remember that in as much as we would like our patients to benefit with it there are associated pathophysiologic derangements which can lead to injury if we overdo them do not forget that our pediatric patients are not small adults. Um, mechanical ventilation should aim to optimize their comfort and work of breathing. Okay, with that, bon voyage. See you all in our next destination. God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dalek. Thank you, Bo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I know it's a... Uh, a very special afternoon. We just brought you pediatric mechanical ventilation in focus. Two great speakers and our moderator. It's time to distribute and to present our digital certificates. Our e-certificates this afternoon right for you, my dear friends. First e-certificate we'd like to present this to Dr. Alvin C. Florentino in grateful recognition and appreciation as speaker in PQMRT fifth station, pediatric mechanical in focus, respiratory support made easy, the basics of mechanical ventilation given today, 23rd of June, year 2021, signed Dr. Adelia Ciprian, our program director, and Jane DeRoyter C. Orozeo, chairman CEO of Dalex Pharma International. Congratulations. Next e-certificate. And our next e-certificate, this one we'd like to present this to you, Sir, Sir Jerickson A. Bayani, in grateful recognition and appreciation as speaker in PQMRT fifth station, pediatric mechanical in focus, troubleshooting in 
Mechanical Ventilation, given today, 23rd of June, year 2021. Signed, Dr. Delia G. Cipriano, our program director, and Jay DeRoyter, Seattle CEO, chairman and CEO of Dallas Farm International. And last but not least, hope we can get you again, and we hope that you can see you again next time. As our moderator, Dr. Maria Teresa R. Lorenzo, in grateful recognition and appreciation as moderator in PQMRT 5th Station, Pediatric Mechanical in Focus, Re Respiratory Support Made Easy, the Basics of Mechanical Ventilation, and Troubleshooting and Mechanical Ventilation. Given today, 23rd of June, year 2021, signed Dr. Adelia G. Cipriano, our Program Director, and Jane DeRoyter, CEO of SEO, Chairman and CEO of Dallas Farm International. And to all of you, our friends, coming from all over the world, French Polynesia, okay, Cambodia, name it, from Makati or from the Republic of Bohol. Hi, this one's for you. For having successfully completed two hour webinar on PQMRT 5th Station, Pediatric Mechanical in Focus, Respiratory Support Made Easy, The Basics of Mechanical Ventilation and Troubleshooting in Mechanical Ventilation, given today, 23rd of June, year 2021. Dr. G. Cipriano, our program director, and of course, Jade Reuters, CEO of SEO, Chairman and CEO of Dallas Pharma International. So good afternoon to you guys. Hope to see you again. Oh, by the way, we are also live on Facebook and YouTube. And on this page is a self-directed uh, process, okay? This one's for CPD units. So follow the instructions religiously. And so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been a wonderful afternoon. But then again, we would like to uh, we would like to welcome and, of course, listen to the voice of our uh, AVP for VP for Sales. Please welcome. Good evening. Sir Another Tony goal Mabalet. of our pediatric forum webinar has been unlocked. That will be your instrument to your journey as allied healthcare practitioners. Delex Pharma would like to express its heartfelt gratitude to one and all, from our excellent lecturers up to our pediatric ICU faculty. Your dedication and effort in making this pediatric ICU forum successful are embedded in our hearts. We hope that the valuable information and best practices shared by our distinguished speakers will be a guiding light to your profession. Likewise, this added knowledge will pave the way to inspire you to think of new ways how to be the best partners in providing quality healthcare to your patients and customers. Secondly, Delex Pharma International Incorporated aims to bridge the gaps in critical care by providing quality and cost-effective medicines and medical devices to the greatest number of people. Our hospital sales representatives and district sales managers visiting you in your respective pharmacies, critical care units, operating theaters, and emergency rooms will ensure that they can fulfill these vital roles during their engagements with you. We hope to continue and grow the partnership with you to provide the best quality healthcare to all. Maraming salamat po. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, AVP World Sales, Anthony Moraleta. And so congratulations to everyone. Hope to see you again. Name is Brad Pitt for Dallas Pharma International, home of the ICU Forum Program, raising the standard of critical care practices. We've got more for you, my dear good friends. I know, I know you've been waiting for this and for the next events that we've got. We would like to invite you next time, July 7. What do we have? A second special edition, Managing ICP in the Neural ICU. That'll be on July 7. Don't forget that that'll be a date, 3 to 5 p.m., all right? And, of course, inviting you once again, July 14, Wednesday, 3 to 5 p.m., Massive GI Bleeding. That'll be, again, a uh, perioperative ICU forum, July 14, 2021, Wednesday. Two great events and more coming up for you. Once again, we are live on Facebook and uh, YouTube.
And this is brought to you by Dalex Pharma International, home of the ICU form program, raising the standard of critical care practices. More invites for you. Don't forget this. Mid-station, all aboard the PQMRET. That'll be on July 15, the troubled brain. Don't forget that. Hope to see all of you again, the 3,000 plus from all over the world. The Troubled Brain, July 15th, Thursday. That's 3 p.m. till 5 p.m. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, flash on screen, follow us on social media. Well, if you want to take a review and take a peek about how it was before, you can get into our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel, if you want to take a review, if you want to replay, we, we are always there. So again, follow us on social media. This is powered by Dalex Pharma International. And so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your active attendance. Name is Brad Pitt, uh, coming to you live from Coron Palawan. And I tell you, distance or not, uh, we are all in this. One